All right, I am going to pray for us, and then we'll get started. God, thank you so much for your word. It is uh, really the only hope that we have to be uh, adequately equipped to know what we must do to be saved from your wrath, uh, even to have practical instructions for uh, all of life and how to think about the things that we see, how to inform our own minds, how to pursue you well, how to change. Your word gives us answers to all of these things and more. It is uh, all that we need to live a life pleasing to you. God, I pray that as we discuss over the next few weeks uh, the doctrine of the perspicuity of scripture, as we look into the clarity of your word. I pray that you would do what you have said that your word is useful for accomplishing, and that is to enlighten our eyes, that as we look into your crystal clear word, God, that we would have our own understanding, our own sight clarified uh, by you. I pray that this Equipping, the strengthening would make us love you more, to marvel at your wisdom and power and authority and your own clarity. And as those things are accomplished in our lives, God, I pray that that we would be made better sufferers, that we would be more equipped to suffer well, to endure uh, reproach for the sake of the gospel and the sake of making Christ known. We know you love to accomplish these things in your people, and so we pray that you would accomplish it in us. In Christ's name, amen. In 1852, Frederick Douglass, who was a slave-turned-abolitionist. He gave a speech called The Meaning of July 4th for the Negro. And as he delivered this speech on the significance of July 4th for blacks and whites who found themselves uh, with the opportunity for celebrating July 4th, he actually had some admiration for the American forefathers. And he says about the founding fathers of this country that he who will intelligently lay his life down for his country is a man whom it is not in human nature to despise. and remembrance. And we do remember martyrs. Uh, As believers, uh, we remember those who have died for the faith. Their lives pique our interest. Their deaths grow our courage. It would be a great benefit to us to know more about martyrs uh, from Scripture, from church history, to consider their way of life, to understand the circumstances leading up to their deaths, to comprehend the convictions that sustained them during their persecution, and even to study the issues over which they lost their lives would be a great benefit to the church. This would be a great benefit to Grace Bible Church. All of these things would aid us in actually modeling godly examples of those who have gone before us. In considering the models that we have in so many Christian martyrs, what qualities would you expect to see in 
these men and women and even at times children who died for the faith? What would you think are the necessary ingredients, if you will, for making a martyr? Characteristics like courage, faith, humility, self-control, patience, long-suffering, love, even a willingness to forgive persecutors. All of these things can be easily found actually in the lives of Christian martyrs throughout church history. But with this series that we're starting today in Equipping Hour, I want to actually put another quality in front of you, another quality to stand out in Christian martyrs. And this quality is clarity. Clarity. Just as faith and courage and love for God's enemies are necessary ingredients to Christian martyrdom, so is clarity about what we believe. And this personal clarity possessed by martyrs is predicated on the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture. The perspicuity or clarity of Scripture is absolutely essential to the Christian life and especially to martyrdom in particular. And the reason that the perspicuity of Scripture is necessary to making a martyr is because no one would dare to die for an unclear truth. No one would dare to die for something that they are not absolutely clear on. If you're willing to sacrifice your life, then you have to possess certainty that is the result of clarity. In other words, no one ever died for an unclear word from God. Those men and women who died for the faith did so because they knew that God had spoken clearly. They were willing to shed their blood in order to have a clear word from God. Their blood for God's clarity. This is what the doctrine of perspicuity cost them. Now turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings 22. 1 Kings chapter 22, that's where we'll be this morning. And this passage is going to make us see these two themes, perspicuity and persecution, in close proximity to each other. This is a useful passage to see both truths highlighted, the perspicuity of God's word and the persecution of God's people. And in this passage, in this chapter of scripture, these two things, it is quickly evident that they are inseparable. In 1 Kings 22, we encounter a prophet who knows with full conviction what he has heard from God. He knows that he has received a clear word from God And this clear word from God in the end will cost him his life. If you haven't read 1 Kings 22 recently, I'm spoiling it for you. But this is how the story goes. This prophet will lose his life. He will spill his blood because of God's clarity. This passage has at least 10 lessons to teach us regarding the perspicuity of Scripture. 10 lessons in 1 Kings regarding the perspicuity of Scripture is what we'll see. And I'm going to read the bulk of this passage uh, for us just so that we are clear on pretty much the entirety of this story from the beginning. So 1 Kings chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Three years passed without war between Aram and Israel. In the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and we are still doing nothing to take it out of the hand of the king of Aram? And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to the to battle at Ramoth Gilead? 
And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Moreover, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire first for the word of Yahweh. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? And they said, go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not yet a prophet of Yahweh here that we may inquire of him? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of Yahweh, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. But Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting each on his throne, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chinda'ana, made horns of iron for himself and said, Thus says Yahweh, with these you will gore the Arameans until they are consumed. All the prophets were prophesying thus, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for Yahweh will give it into the hand of the king. Then the messenger, who went to summon Micaiah, spoke to him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Please let your words be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, as Yahweh lives, what Yahweh says to me, that I shall speak. When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go up and succeed and Yahweh will give it into the hand of the king. Then the king said to him, how many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of Yahweh? So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And Yahweh said, these have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne, all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. Yahweh said, who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before Yahweh and said, I will entice him. Yahweh said to him, how? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he that is Yahweh said, you are to entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. Now, therefore, behold, Yahweh has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. And Yahweh has proclaimed disaster against you. Then Zedekiah the son of Chena'ana, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, how did the spirit of Yahweh pass from me to speak to you? Micaiah said, behold, you will see on the, that day when you enter an inner room to hide yourself. Then the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, Put this man in prison and feed him sparingly with bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah said, if you indeed return safely, Yahweh has not spoken by me. And he said, listen, all you people. This is one of those passages 
that is so shocking, so surprising, it just arrests your attention and, and almost makes you wonder, how is this in my Bible? I remember the first time that I, I had read this, in build, encouraged to read the Bible in a year, and I was sitting at my kitchen table on the next thing in the McShane reading plan, and I literally stopped and looked around and thought, does anybody else know this is in the scriptures? Am I, is, yeah, this is still my Bible. But what's highlighted here throughout this passage is the perspicuity of Scripture. Now, if you were paying close attention, you'll notice that no Scripture or written revelation was mentioned in the passage, only what God had spoken, his spoken revelation. But whatever is true about the clarity of what God has spoken is also true about the Scriptures, since the scriptures are merely the word of God written. The scriptures are just the word of God written down. So whatever is true of God's spoken word is also true of that spoken word once it is inscribed. As J.C. Ryle said, when you read the Bible, you are not reading the self-taught compositions of poor, imperfect men like yourself but rather the words of the eternal God. When you hear it, you are not listening to the erring opinions of short-lived mortals, but to the unchanging mind of the King of Kings. That is what scripture is. And so these 10 lessons that we have to learn from 1 Kings 22 regarding the perspicuity of scripture, number one is that it is needed. It is needed needed. The perspicuity of Scripture is needed. As Israel embarks upon another war with Aram, after a three-year hiatus from doing battle, what this king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, even though he is uh, unwise to be in leagues with Ahab, the king of Israel, he is wise to at least know what God has to say about it. Verse 5, Jehoshaphat, after uh, committing all of his military resources and even his own life to be in conjunction with the king of Israel, you'll see that in verse 4, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. He, what he recognizes that he needs is a clear word from God regarding this particular endeavor. Verse 5, please inquire first of the word of Yahweh. He needs to know what God has to say about this battle, particularly its outcome. He needs clarity from the Lord, from God's communication. Now, in this case, this is a particular event, a particular endeavor that this king is seeking clarity on. But the principle holds true for us as well, that Clarity from God's word is absolutely necessary. We need clarity from God's word. Uh, we need this in the eternal sense, and we need it w when it comes to temporary matters. Our eternity is absolutely dependent on clarity from what God has spoken. When the question is asked, what must I do to be saved? If you had in response to that question, what must I do to be saved, anything less than a clear word from God, then your eternity would immediately be in jeopardy. If God responded and answered the question, what must I do to be saved, with an unclear message, 
you would have no hope of certainty that you could be saved because the very word that came from God is unclear to you. It can't be understood. Your eternity hinges on that. Imagine if a passage like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Imagine if those words that are so simple that you must believe to be saved and avoid the condemnation of God. Imagine if that wasn't very clear, if that passage wasn't that clear, if it wasn't clear to you that all you had to do to be saved was believe in Christ, in his substitutionary atonement, in your place as the means by which a loving God gave on your behalf. You would be lost. The clarity of God's word is needed eternally, but also temporarily. Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way to death. Imagine if you were left by God to your own wisdom, your own devices and opinions, with no clear instructions from him on how to live. This passage says that you would kill yourself eventually. And people who reject the wisdom of God oftentimes do foolish things that get them killed because they are left without the wisdom of God to know how to live. Clarity from what God has said is eternally and temporally significant. The, the second lesson that we can learn from this passage besides the necessity that the clarity of God's word is needed is number two, it is not determined by a majority. The clarity of God's word is not determined by a majority. Verse six in, in our passage, then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together about 400 men 400 individuals coming together and making a decision about what they say God has clearly said. This same group is mentioned again in verse 10. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting each on his throne, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. And then again in verses 12 and 13, the prophets, the prophets. This is a reference to 400 people declaring, thus says the Lord. With those 400 prophets are two kings, their servants, and their officials. You have hundreds of people seemingly all in agreement about what God is saying. But if you're paying attention, that's actually not what God had said. The clarity of the scriptures, the clarity of what God says is not determined by a majority. It's not a majority vote. Whether God's word is clear is not up to the majority. As if, if the whole world decided today God's word is not clear, that would have no bearing on whether or not God's word was actually clear. The clarity of God's word is not dependent, it's not determined by the majority in that sense. And not only is whether or not God's word 
clear, not dependent on the majority, but the content of God's word, what God has clearly said is not determined by the majority. In this passage, you have one man against hundreds of people, prophets with the same title, with the same resume as him, and people who even outrank him, kings, in agreement against this one man saying what God has said. But as the passage shows, what God has actually said, what he has actually clearly communicated, is not determined by the majority view. And if you're aware of some of this church's minority theological opinions, then that's a comfort to you. We are certainly in the world the minority. We're, we're the minority on every theological opinion when it comes to the world in general. But even within Christendom, take out those who claim to be Christians, Catholics, Mormons, evangelicals, we still, as a church, hold some pretty minority views. Um, our soteriology or view of salvation might be one of them. That God is absolutely sovereign over salvation. He chooses who to save and who to condemn. That is a minority view in Christendom. Our ecclesiology would fall into this category of being the minority position. Uh, things that characterize our ecclesiology or our, uh, our practices as a church, right? Our understanding of the church and what it should be doing. Take, for example, how we train men. I just talked to a pastor on Friday who the way we train men was completely foreign to him. It was assumed, well, of course the church isn't going to have the resources to train men. And so we, as a church, it's right that we outsource our seminary training. Well, with the Expositor Seminary, we don't outsource our seminary training. We consider it the pastor's duty to train pastors, like God says. And even before we had the additional resources that the Expositor Seminary from the other 10 campuses affords us, we were still convinced that we had to train men in-house because that's the way God says we should do it. That's the, the way that he says a pastor is trained. And so what, is, what do we do? The, the more specialized areas, men took it upon themselves to grow in those and be excellent. Things like Greek and Hebrew, church history, just because the experts have said that that's their expertise, that's their job, doesn't mean the church gets to disregard what God says and hand the training of pastors over to an institution. Our ecclesiology and our training of men is the minority position. What we've done with biblical counseling, as you recently heard in uh, the uh, Equipping Hour series, that I did for a few weeks. That is the minority position that we don't refer out. We have made it our ambition to be sufficient to train our own people. Even the way we practice church discipline, I'm learning more and more that it's a minority position. To actually take seriously the instructions of Jesus in Matthew 18, Titus 1, 1 Corinthians 5, and put out sinning members uh, who refuse to repent, not just sinning members, but those who refuse to repent, that is the minority in churches. Oftentimes, you come here and you see a practice for the first time, and you go, I've never seen that practice anywhere else. That's the experience of most of us at Grace Bible Church. And even our, well, especially our eschatology, what gets taught at this church about eschatology, 
that Jesus will rescue the church before the day of the Lord, before the tribulation, and then shortly after, pouring out wrath on the world, Jesus will come and establish his kingdom for a literal thousand years and reign on earth. We love that doctrine, and yet that's the minority position, especially when you take all the other minority positions we hold and put them together. It's encouraging that God's clarity isn't dependent on a majority view because understanding that we would hold that we can come to the scriptures and even if it's not held by the majority today, those aren't minority positions historically, by the way. We're in good company when it comes to church history, when it comes to those things. But even if it's not the majority view today, that's okay. God's word is still clear and it doesn't become less clear because less people agree with us. God's word is not determined, the clarity of it, the perspicuity of it doesn't depend on the majority. It didn't depend on it for the majority when it came to this passage. Micaiah wasn't looking to take the majority position because God's word was clear and so should we. Lesson three, its heralds are hated. Its heralds are hated. Those who know the clarity of the scriptures and proclaim it as such, who treat God's word as if it is clear, and just say what God has clearly said, those people are hated. That is explicitly what Ahab, the king of Israel, says in verse 8. There is one man by whom we may inquire of Yahweh, but I hate him. He is not shy about this fact. He hates Micaiah, and he says he hates him because he doesn't prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Now just consider who's saying this. It's Ahab. He's annoyed, discontent, even hateful that this true prophet of God won't say something good about him. Just a few chapters earlier, we find Elijah on the run and Israel in a several year drought because of this man's idolatry. He is an idol worshiper and so the promises about Israel's disobedience predicted in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy 28 that the heavens would not send rain, that there would be no plentiful growth of crops and there would be famine if Israel didn't worship Yahweh alone. Those things are being fulfilled in Ahab's day because of Ahab's poor leadership, because of his sinful idolatry. And he expects to hear a favorable word from God? God's word is clearly against you, even in what Moses wrote. God's word was clear through Moses. And so Ahab should already know, of course you don't get a favorable word from Yahweh. You're in, in chapters 18 and 19, we find out that Ahab has allowed his wife Jezebel to essentially rule from behind him. And she has so persecuted the true prophets of Yahweh that they all go into hiding. They go into hiding to the point that Elijah doesn't think that there are any true worshipers left. And yet there's a faithful man in submission to Ahab who actually hides them in caves. Obadiah, he feeds them and keeps them safe from the king. You have run all of the truly God-ordained prophets out of town through persecution of them, and you expect to hear a favorable word from God? 
What a foolish expectation from a foolish king. It also makes you wonder what, what these other 400 prophets are. Where's Elijah? N nowhere to be found. <laughs> and this is why Jehoshaphat, recognizing something's wrong here, these aren't, where are the true prophets? He asks for a true prophet. The true prophets are nowhere to be found. These are self-appointed prophets who are hired essentially by the king to tell him what, what he wants to hear, and they don't fail him in that regard. The heralds of God's clarity are hated. Where there is a lack of clarity, like these men have in this moment, these 400 prophets, the one who comes in with a clear word from God that's actually true, he immediately becomes a threat to everybody else in the room. The ones who think they have clarity and don't have clarity about the truth are threatened by this one individual, really of no repute, who comes into the room with clarity about the truth. And so he's hated for it. It is, this is to his credit that he is hated for communicating, for just repeating a clear word from God. This is to Micaiah's credit. And just by implication, ask yourself, am I hated for the clear word that I have received from God? Notice if Micaiah would have shown up and just said what everybody else had said, there would have been no reason to despise him. Or if he would have shown up and said nothing at all, there would have been no reason to despise him. He had to actually open his mouth and say what God said in order to be hated. And so if the Christian is not hated by people who hate God's clear revelation, then it's worth asking the question, why not? Is it because you just agree with the unsound words of the crowd, of the majority? Is it because you lack the boldness of actually saying what God has said and you're not echoing God? Or if you are hated, is it because you clearly articulated what God has clearly said? Because you could be hated for other reasons. That would not be to our benefit. If Micaiah would have shown up and been ungodly and he was hated for a lack of godliness, that would not have been to his credit. The same applies to us. If we would be hated for something other than what God has said, that is not a benefit. The apostle Peter said, it's to your credit if you do good and are suffered uh, and, and suffer for it. What credit is it to you if you sin and are treated harshly? That's not noble. So we should make sure that we're disliked for godly reasons even. And it's okay to cause those kinds of offenses, right? When you were saved, were you not first offended by the gospel? Did God's truth not have to first offend you, assault your pride before you humbled yourself, right? Don't avoid offense at all costs. It is right to, for God's truth to be offensive by those, uh, to those who don't accept it. And so all who stand before Christ as Savior must first stumble over him as a stumbling block, as an offense, that should be an encouragement to us. Lessons four and five sort of go together. When it comes to the perspicuity of God's word, it is not determined by rank. Lesson four, it is not determined by rank. And lesson five, 
from this passage, it is not determined by titles. It is not determined by rank. It is not determined by titles. How clear God's word is, is not determined by these things. And what God's word clearly says is also not determined by someone with a significant ranking or an important title. Again, just to draw your attention to verse 10, you have two kings. No one ranks higher on a human level than these two kings in these nations. And yet they do not determine the clarity of God's word. Whether it's clear, the character of it, they don't determine whether it's clear or not, and they don't determine the content of it, what it clearly says. Also, by way of titles, just think about, again, these are 400 prophets. Same or superior resume to Micaiah, the clarity of God's word is not determined by the mere fact that these people are titles uh, or are prophets, that they have the title of prophet. These things don't qualify them to make a determination about what God's word clearly says. This is actually the very thing that was fought for by the uh, reformers during the the Reformation, 1500s, 1600s, uh, men and women died to give the common man God's word, to take it out of the hands of the priests, the Pope, who were saying, Scripture's too confusing, it's too obscure, it, it can't even be discerned by us hardly in Latin, so certainly the common man can't understand. And people died convinced of the very opposite, that if you just give God's people God's word, they can understand and they can gain clarity. We'll talk about who some of those martyrs were who gave their life for that conviction in a few weeks. The title of pastor, the title of priest, the title of professor, none of those titles do anything to ensure that somebody has clarity about God's word. The only standard when it comes to the clarity of God's word is God's word itself. Is God's word clear? God's word alone can tell you. God himself says whether or not it is so. Again, J.C. Ryle said, I would go, I would to God that the laity would learn to weigh sermons, books, opinions, and ministers in the scales of the Bible and to value all according to their conformity to the word. I would to God that they would see that it matters little who says a thing whether he be father or reformer, bishop or archbishop, priest or deacon, archdeacon or dean. The only question is, is the thing said scriptural? That is what matters. Lesson six to be learned from this passage about the perspicuity of scripture is that it is obscured by liars. The perspicuity of scripture, the clarity of God's word, is obscured by liars. In verses 10 through 12, this is the very thing that's happening. And it becomes clear by what God says through Micaiah later that this is, in fact, a ruse. It is a lie that is being perpetuated through these false prophets. God desires to destroy Ahab. There's no getting around that. And so what does God do to ensure Ahab's destruction on a human level? Well, he uses means. One spirit, some angelic being, to go into the mouth of these 400 prophets and be a deceiving spirit. 
There's no way around God being the one orchestrating that happening in this passage. And it's successful. God says that it will be successful. Verse 22, Yahweh said to him, how? And this spirit said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, that is Yahweh said, you are to entice him and prevail. God tells him he's going to be successful. And back in verse 12, all the prophets were prophesying thus, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper for Yahweh will give it into the hand of, of the king. They are lying. They are deceived and they are deceiving. Both things are true. And so what God clearly says is going to happen is obscured by the very lies of these 400 prophets. If verse 10 was translated uh, in, in a wooden literal sense, at the end of verse 10, it would read, and all the prophets were prophesying to one another before them. This is one prophet lying and another responding with lies about what God actually has not said. It's an echo chamber of deceit. 400 prophets saying what is coming from their own mind rather than what God has clearly said one to another a giant echo chamber of, of, of falsehood. And so the clarity of what God deems true is actually made confusing. Confusion is introduced by these liars. Is this not what happened in the garden? Genesis 3. God's word spoken with crystal clear clarity in Genesis 1, two and, uh, 1 and 2, so clear that when he said, let light be, light came and not something else, God was clear on every day of creation. And the lack of clarity is introduced as something foreign by the serpent, the deceiver. There's a, there's a profound lesson in that. God's word on its own is crystal clear. There is not a single imperfection in God's word. Psalm 19.8, the commandment of Yahweh is pure. It means clear. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's word is so clear that it makes you clear when you look into it in faith. A lack of clarity has to be introduced from outside of what God has actually said. Wherever there is a lack of clarity, those ideas that make God's word obscure don't come from God's word itself. It's not the result of God's word being inherently confusing. It's not confusing. We are confused. And so the fault lies somewhere with us. And we'll talk about why that, why that is in the weeks to come. Furthermore, lesson seven, notice that this clarity is opposed by the proud. It is opposed by the proud. The perspicuity of scripture is resisted by prideful people. You see this illustrated in verse 13. The messenger who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him saying, behold, now the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Never mind that they're false words. That doesn't matter. And we're not interested in even knowing whether they're false. He says, let your words be like the words of one of them and speak favorably. Here's your job. You're a prophet of God, 
but we're not interested in knowing what God clearly says. And if one person has the right view, if he's clearer than the other 400, this messenger, like the king of Israel, has already decided what God is supposed to have said. That is the pinnacle of arrogance. To come to God's word before you know what God has said and determine for yourself what you're going to hear is incredibly arrogant. It is pride. And just think about the ways that we do this. In our Bible reading, this morning, I want to be encouraged. So I open my Bible, and in my heart, even though I might pray, all right, God, show me what you want me to see from your word, I can actually have, while praying that prayer, be double-minded and have the attitude that I'm going to be encouraged this morning. I'm not going to be rebuked. I'm not going to be corrected. I'm not going to be disciplined. I'm going to have no pangs of conscience when I read God's word. God, what you must tell me this morning is encouragement. It's not wrong to be encouragement. It's just wrong to tell God he's going to encourage you regardless of what he might want to say to you. That is arrogant. It is also arrogant for something to have a good desire, like seeing the gospel in Scripture, and to come with that mindset to say, God, the most encouraging or profitable message that I can think of, you say for yourself that the gospel is of first importance, 1 Corinthians 15. But if you come to your Bible and tell God, regardless of what passage you're in, that you must see penal substitutionary atonement and the resurrection of the Messiah, that's arrogant. That's arrogant to say, here is what I must see, even if the desire is something like the gospel. What if God has you in another passage? What if it's a passage in Ezekiel or Isaiah about judgment only? Not about what the Messiah would do to rescue God's people. Do you want to see that? That's humble to just open God's word and just receive it for what it says. It's clear. And if you come to Scripture with an an agenda laid over the top of your Bible, then it will obscure what you're supposed to see because you'll just be reading into it your own thoughts. You'll see Christ where Christ is not. Whatever God has said is better for us And if we just trust him to communicate clearly, then he knows well enough how to speak for himself. And you will be thankful for whatever you see there. Lesson eight, it is upheld by the humble. The perspicuity of scripture is upheld by the humble. Contrast Micaiah's response with the messenger. He's so humble that before he even arrives at the threshing floor and enter into this realm of, you know, this huge entourage, he has already made up his mind as Yahweh lives, as certainly as that is true, what Yahweh says to me, that I shall speak. He is insistent, resolved to say exactly what God says as if God's own life depended on it. Is God living? Then I'm going to say what he's, what he's told me to say and nothing else. That's humble. Even if it costs him his life, which it will, that's humble. It is upheld by the humble. Lesson nine, it produces certainty and boldness. It produces certainty and boldness. The clarity of God's word produces in the humble recipient of God's word both clarity or certainty and boldness. This is what he demonstrates in everything he says. In everything Micaiah says, he shows he has personal 
subjective certainty (laughs) because he is clear about what God has said, clearly. God has spoken a clear word. He has clear insight and just humbly received what God has clearly said. And what does that produce in him? Certainty, boldness. If you want certainty, then assume when you come to your Bible that it is clear. Assume that God has spoken clearly. Assume that where you don't have personal clarity, it's to no fault of God. It's not because things were written in uh, an order that is confusing to you, right? Depending on which gospel you're in, the events are out of order. You know why? Because the clarity of God's word decided to write it that, that way. The more we come to the scriptures with that attitude, the clearer we will be and we will gain both certainty and boldness. Last lesson to learn from this passage about the perspicuity of scripture is that the perspicuity of scripture, the clarity of God's word is upheld in the end by God himself. It is upheld by God himself. God in the end, just as in this narrative, he will vindicate his own clarity. It will be clear to everyone, believers and unbelievers alike, how clear God's word actually was in the end. There are things that have yet to be fulfilled. And for us at times, that becomes a a stumbling block in our understanding. It shouldn't be. But at the end of the day, one day, when all has been revealed, it will be crystal clear that God's word was perspicuous. Just think about, and we we don't have time to read the end of the story. I encourage you on your own, read verses 29 and following. What Micaiah said would happen is exactly what took place, down to every detail he described. How does Ahab get destroyed? How is Israel scattered and left with no shepherd? An archer pulls back his arrow at random and lets it fly, aiming for no one in particular. And even though King Ahab, seeking to avoid the fulfillment of this prophecy, goes out in disguise as a regular soldier and not as the king, the arrow found King Ahab dressed in disguise, even when no one was supposed to attack Anybody but the king. Incredible. There's no good explanation for that except the providence of God. God said something would happen, and so God made sure that what he said would happen came to fruition. Every single prophecy is that. God says what's going to happen, and God ensures that what he said will take place. Acts 3.18, you can write down. What God, thus, what God spoke beforehand through his prophets, he thus fulfilled. God makes sure that his clear word comes to fruition. You can also write, write down John 2.22 because there's an interesting lesson here in how to think about Old Testament prophecy Micaiah did not say that Ahab was going to disguise himself and then a random archer would pull back his bow and a random arrow would find its way into Ahab's uh, armor and kill him. So, so that, the fact that that happened when it was fulfilled doesn't add clarity to what Micaiah said because Micaiah didn't say anything about those details. What Micaiah did say didn't grow in clarity once it was fulfilled. Once the fulfillment happened, it simply proved the clarity that was already there. 
And every single prophecy functions that way in your Old Testament as well as your New. The Old Testament doesn't get clearer because the New Testament fulfills it or when the New Testament fulfills it. The fulfillment of the Old Testament simply proves how clear the Old Testament was to begin with. And that is actually uh, an interesting example is, of that. It happens in John chapter 2, because verse 22, John writes, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the, um, came into the land of Ju Judah, Judea, and there he was. Um, I'm in the wrong verse. I'm in chapter 3, sorry. Chapter 22, so when he was raised, Jesus has already spoken prophecy about being raised. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scriptures and the, and the word which Jesus had spoken. The fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy made them believe what was written beforehand. It didn't get clearer itself. It just needed to be believed the clarity that was already there and what Jesus spoke in the New Testament or after the Old Testament prophecy was added to that, that was equal, equally clear. You should think of your Bible that way. In the weeks to come, we're going to answer the question, how clear is God's word really? How clear is God's word really? And then we're going to see men and women, one after another, die because they are convinced of the absolute clarity of God's word, that's going to be encouraging and strengthening for us to see. So you have that to look forward to. God, thank you so much for your, your word. It is clear, and I pray that you would give us clarity even today as John teaches, as Smed preaches tonight. Help us to receive what you have for us in your perspicuous word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.